Uh, today we're going to be talking about the Unit 5 uh, review PowerPoint, which covers the period or time period of Andrew Jackson and his presidency and kind of the uh, events that happened because of him. And then we'll also get into some events that uh, are not directly caused by him, but will help set the stage for uh, the Civil War. So we started or we ended the last PowerPoint talking about the election of 1828 how Andrew Jackson kind of got his revenge uh, after he was after he felt like he was cheated out of the election of 1824. So he's elected president, and he's going to usher in uh, a time period called the era of the common man. And so uh, the common man is just another word that uh, people sometimes use to describe poor people. And after Andrew Jackson is voted into office, you start to see this time period start to accelerate more and more. And really what it comes down to is that the poor people or more average people and not just the wealthy have more influence, more political power. Um, you can see here on the left, this chart talks about how many people or the percentage of Americans that are voting. And you can see over time, starting in 1824, 1828, when Andrew Jackson's elected, it keeps going up. And that's because people are, or different states are instituting uh, universal white male suffrage, so even poor white males can vote, and they're going to vote for people like Andrew Jackson that they see as part of them, or a part of their group. Um, something that happens whenever a group of people gain suffrage is that more laws are going to be passed to uh, support that group of people because um, the politicians are going to need the support of that group if they're going to win any election. So uh, you're going to see average uh, people have more influence in laws that are passed. You're eventually going to see the debtor's prison, which is essentially going to prison for having debt, for owing debt, uh, will start to be abolished, and that will uh, help out the common man or the poor people. Uh, religion, we'll get to in a little while. That'll be the Second Great Awakening, and the reform movements like, you know, uh, abolishing debtor's prison, treatment of the mentally ill, and stuff like that. Uh, something that Andrew Jackson is really going to champion while he's in office is uh, the, spoil, the spoil system. So what this is is a type of practice where you're giving people a job in government, not really because they're qualified for that job or because they have the uh, education or the experience that's required for that job. You're giving them that job simply because they support you. And... Uh, you can obviously see why that's a bad thing. You're going to have people in government that like you. And sometimes when you're a politician or in power, you need someone to be able to stand up to you and tell you whenever you're doing something wrong. And when Andrew Jackson is sur essentially surrounded by a bunch of yes men that are always going to go uh, exactly the way he tells them to, never going to question him, uh, that's not a good thing. And the problem is, is that there's a ton of these government jobs that are open and every uh, zip code, whether it's in a big city or in a very small town, uh, there's a post office. And in that post office, someone, the postmaster is appointed by the president. So these people that support Andrew Jackson have a lot of job opportunities, but this is not going to be a very sustainable uh, way to run the government, obviously, because people are going to be put in office that are not qualified. They're not going to be able to handle the responsibilities and things are really going to fall apart. And this will uh, stay around for a few decades, but eventually it'll be reformed. And you'll talk about that in American history too. Uh, so around the era of the common man, there's going to be a guy, he's from France, and he comes and visits America uh, around the time of Andrew Jackson when he's in power. And his name is uh, Alexis de Tocqueville. And he's a French guy, and he is going to write a book based off of his visit in America. The book is called Democracy in America. And he's really just talking about the, uh, the happenings in America, the way he sees things in America. And what he's going to write in his book is about how more people seem to be equal in America. The different classes of people seem equal in America. The rich and the poor are really not that uh, separate as they were in Europe, because in Europe, Europe was more established than America, it was wealthier than America, and the classes of people, the rich and the poor, were really separate in Europe, well not in America. So an example of that, uh, 
that he wrote in his book is about train cars. He saw how the rich and the poor did not have to sit in separate train cars. They could sit together in the same train car. Um, another example of that is he saw that the, uh, the people in America would typically raise children on their own. And so this is a sort of more interesting example of it because, uh, you know, children are not really the uh, cleanest people as far as hygiene goes and raising a, a child you have to be able to put up with some, you know, nastier stuff. And in Europe, the wealthier people would essentially uh, pay uh, a servant to do that for them. They really didn't want to get involved in that. Well, in America, people were kind of humble and down to earth enough to raise their own children. Uh, you know, if a child needs their diaper changed or whatever, the people in America would do it and not really pay someone to do it like they did in Europe. So he wrote all of that down in his book. Uh, so while Andrew Jackson is president, what's going to happen is that the North is going to gain a little bit more power in government, and what they're going to do is pass a really high tariff. So uh, remember, a tariff is a tax on imported goods. You're trying to make it more expensive to buy a foreign-made good than it is to buy an American-made good. And so the North is going to get a high tariff passed, and remember, the South is not going to like that because um, they're going to have to pay a retaliatory tariff on another country whenever they're trying to sell their agriculture products. So, you know, if they pass a tariff on Britain, then Britain's going to pass one on America, and the South will have to pay that, uh, for example, when they're trying to sell their cotton. So the South is going to stand up to Andrew Jackson and stand up to the North, and specifically the state of South Carolina is going to challenge uh, this tariff. They call it the tariff of, of, of abominations. They didn't like this tariff at all. And... Um, Keep in mind that Andrew Jackson was a Southerner. He came from the South, and he probably did not support this tariff. But when the state of South Carolina challenged his authority because he's a, a strong man, a, a tough leader, he didn't like it when people challenged his authority. He stood up to South Carolina and said that he would send warships down to South Carolina and blow South Carolina off the map if they did not back down. And eventually they did back down. But this really foreshadows uh, the Civil War because you're seeing that a, a, a state, a southern state of South Carolina is starting to... Uh, view a northern tariff as a bad thing. They're even going to threaten to go against it. They're going to nullify the tariff in South Carolina. Remember the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions where that idea kind of came up. They're going to put it into practice here. Uh, but eventually it's not going to work and it's not going to work because Andrew Jackson said that he wasn't going to put up with a challenge to his power. So uh, in the Senate around this time period, and kind of as a result of the nullification crisis, you're going to have the webster hain debates. And so these were a series of kind of debates between two senators, um, Daniel Webster and uh, Robert Hain, I think was his name. And they're going to talk about the issue of nullification and whether or not a state could legally say that a law was nullified or did not, um, did not have any sway in their state. Basically, can a state ignore federal laws is what they debated. And they're going to go back and forth, and I don't really know who won the debate, but it starts to show that a northern senator and a southern senator are, are starting to debate on whether or not the power, of the, the power of the federal government, because if a state can nullify a law, then ultimately you're saying the state government is more powerful than the federal government. And so... They're going to debate on this, they're going to debate whether the federal government is stronger, whether the federal government could enforce a law even if a state did not like it. And this will really foreshadow the Civil War because what's going to happen is that there's going to be some laws that are going to be passed in the 1850s that uh, the South is not going to like. They're going to try to nullify it, and it will eventually kind of lead up to them trying to nullify the election of 1860 with Abraham Lincoln. But this is really the first step the South will take into questioning uh, whether or not the federal government has power to enforce a law, even if a state does not like that law and that state wants to nullify the law. So while Andrew Jackson is president, something that is really uh, controversial and really a dark stain uh, in American history is the Indian Removal Act. So this law will be passed, it will be enforced by Andrew Jackson, 
And what it's going to do is authorize any Native American living here in the eastern part of the country, typically in the south, uh, and they're going to be basically moved over to a, a designated area. They're going to call it Indian Territory. Today it's called Oklahoma, the state of Oklahoma. And so this was a forced march. The uh, Native Americans had no choice. They had to move away from their homeland, their, the homeland they had occupied for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, the only uh, land they had ever called home. They were going to be forced off of that land, and it's justified because people like Andrew Jackson said, well, the white uh, people, uh, our population is growing. The white people need this land to farm. And keep in mind, this kind of orange area here in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, uh, this land is very fertile. Cotton is growing. The cotton kingdom is taking hold in the south. And if you remove Native Americans off of this land, then you're going to be able to have and grow more cotton. So a lot of people are going to die. A lot of the Native Americans are going to die on this uh, route. A very famous one that the Cherokee Indians took is called the Trail of Tears because so many people died. If they were marching in the winter, they would uh, sometimes die of hypothermia. They would get pneumonia and die. Uh, a lot of the elderly people and the young children were often the ones that were impacted the most by it. Uh, it's not a very pleasant thing to talk about, but it is something that happened in American history, and uh, it's really one of the you know worst things that our nation has done. Uh, and eventually, a group of Native Americans is going to challenge Andrew Jackson on this, and. And Worcester versus Georgia, the Native Americans are going to take this issue all the way to the Supreme Court. And what they're going to do is say that we have a right to this land because they had signed a treaty with the state of Georgia that they could keep their land. And Andrew Jackson kind of tries to go against that treaty. And when he does, the Native Americans fight back. And ultimately, the Supreme Court will rule not in favor of Andrew Jackson, but in favor of the Native Americans, in favor of the Cherokee. But for the first time in American history, and really for the only time in American history, Andrew Jackson will ignore the Supreme Court of the United States. And if you've taken civics, you know that we have a system of checks and balances in our government. If the Supreme Court declares something unconstitutional or goes against the president, then that is supposed to stand. There's nothing the president should be able to do to go against it. But Andrew Jackson is going to say, nope, I don't agree with that. I'm going to do it anyway. And it even got to the point, John Marshall, remember talking about him, he was the chief justice. He was the one that handed down this uh, decision. Andrew Jackson said something along the lines of, Mr. Marshall has made his decision, let him enforce it. And so he's basically saying, I am the, uh, the commander-in-chief, I have an army, I can do what I want. And he does. The Native Americans, the Cherokee Indians are going to be forced off of their land. The Trail of Tears will happen. Uh, many of them are going to die. They're marching thousands of miles away to a land that they don't know away from their homeland, and many of them are going to die, uh, unfortunately, along the way. And a lot of people are going to criticize Andrew Jackson. They're going to call him a king, a monarch, a tyrant, or a dictator because of his you know, blatant uh, ignoring of the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, something else that Andrew Jackson is going to do is called the Bank War. So keep in mind that uh, under Henry Clay's American system, the second bank of the United States will be chartered, but Andrew Jackson is not going to like the bank of the United States. He's not going to like it because keep in mind he's from the South. He thought it was unconstitutional. He uh, didn't think that the Constitution allowed for the bank of the United States to exist. So what Andrew Jackson is going to do is kind of go against the bank of the United States by taking the money of the um the federal government out of that bank and he's going to put that money in what's called a pet bank. A pet bank is really like a a state bank. The national bank, the Bank of the United States, kind of covered the entire country, the entire uh, economy. Well, the state banks are ran by the individual states. So there's a state bank of Virginia, a, a state bank of North Carolina like where we live. 
And so Andrew Jackson will divide up the money in the Bank of the United States and put them into those state banks. Well, if the Bank of the United States does not have any money left, then the Bank of the United States is not going to be able to operate. And, you know, if, if you don't have any money, there's nothing that, that it can do. So he's essentially going to kill the Bank of the United States. He, uh, something else that's going to happen while Andrew, jo or Andrew Jackson is president, Andrew Johnson will come later on, is uh, the idea of immigration coming into the United States. So after the American Revolution ended and the country was established and starting to gain its uh, footing in the world, more people wanted to come uh, to the United States to start over, start a new life. And these uh, main two groups of people that did that were the Germans and the Irish. So the Germans and the Irish were both uh, poor groups of people. The Irish were probably poorer than the Germans, but they both uh, still struggled quite a bit. And the Irish expressed especially would come uh, into the northeast where all those factories are and they would go and work in those factories oftentimes for a really 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 low wage and very bad conditions but they did it because they were desperate they were poor and they needed that money even though it was not a lot and they were still struggling quite a bit when they came to the united states now the germans were for the most part going to go out and settle in the midwest they would work on farms somewhat uh in the midwest and what they would do also is create breweries so you can see here they would make beer they'd make whiskey but at, at this time period the uh, americans are going to view both the germans and the irish because the irish would drink too uh, but especially the germans they would view them as being alcoholics as uh, uncultured and whenever they viewed them like this, they uh, had nativism thrown against them. And what nativism is, is whenever you are uh, being hostile toward a group of immigrants that come into the nation that may have a different culture than you do, and the Germans and the Irish did. And it largely centered around the idea of them, uh, you know, being uncultured, drinking too much alcohol, and so on. So, speaking of nativism, that the... Uh, that the Germans and the Irish had. Uh, its definition is really strong hostility toward foreigners. Or, and foreigners are really just a group of people that come into your nation and they're from a different country and they typically will have a different culture than the culture of the people in the United States. And so whenever they get here, they're viewed as an outsider. They, they think that because they came from a different country that they are a lesser uh, group of people that they don't uh, deserve the same amount of respect that other native born Americans got and that's one way you can remember nativism think native and so the native born uh, Americans were hostile toward the foreign born Americans so they would kind of express this nativism in many ways one famous example you see here is denying them work so uh, they would say, the Irish, you can't work here. Now, eventually, uh, the Irish would get jobs in the northern factories because really there were no Americans that would take those jobs because the conditions were so bad. And so the Irish would do it and do it for a really low price because they were desperate. And, uh, you know, I talked about the alcohol uh, problems that they had. They would drink a lot. A lot of Americans, especially in that time period, looked down uh, on alcohol and alcohol consumption, especially with the temperance movement that we'll talk about in just a little while. So, a expression of that nativism is through the Know Nothing Party. The Know Nothing Party is also called the uh, American Party, and so it's really you know easy to tell from their name uh, what they believe in. They are a nativist party. They are the party that above the rest the other parties express that nativism and so if you are a white american and you do not like the immigrants that are coming into the nation then you'd probably join the know nothing party uh, as it was sometimes called the way they got their name is uh you would sometimes ask them about what they believed in they'd say i knew nothing and so they were really secretive about what they believed in uh, but it was very clear to most people that they were a nativist party. And uh, one example of that nativism is through religion. 
and so especially the Irish immigrants when they came into the United States, they brought their religion with them. Now keep in mind, Ireland is a Catholic country. The United States, for the most part, was a Protestant country. And so uh, being a Protestant and being a Catholic, they're both still Christians, but the Catholics were a different branch of Christianity. And whenever they came into the country, a lot of the Protestant Americans would view them as being like a heretic, as not really following the same religion that they believe in. And so that was another uh, example of that discrimination they had. You can see here it talks about foreign influence. A lot of people thought that if you brought these Catholic immigrants, the Irish Catholic immigrants into the nation, then you're essentially going to allow the Pope, which is the head of the Catholic Church, to uh, essentially run America. Obviously, all of these fears are really unfounded and you know out of touch with reality, but a lot of Americans believe that because they saw all of these immigrants coming into the nation that they didn't want. Um, uh, another thing that's going to happen, and this kind of relates more to the era of the common man, is the Second Great Awakening. So, uh, prior to the Second Great Awakening, you had, like I said, a lot of Protestant, uh, denominations in the United States, and a denomination is just a, a group of, of Christians. So, they're all Christians, but they're just in different groups. And so, what they would do is they would emphasize more, more or less the doctrine of that religion or of that denomination, and they really wouldn't value the person as much. And so this gave the Second Great Awakening, it gave more power to the common man or the average people because instead of uh, affiliating more with a doctrine, you affiliate more with a person. And so they would talk about the idea of being saved and that your ability to go to heaven rests not on some authority figure in the church, but on your shoulders because it's your responsibility to form a, a personal relationship with God. And so these people would go out and they would give these sermons. Uh, they were called camp meetings. They'd go out and, and they were really emotional. They'd try to get people riled up. You see some people here are literally passed out because of the emotion that they felt. And so, and they appealed all of these people in the audience, they're common people, and so they're feeling that more personal relationship that this movement kind of uh, preaches. Another thing that will happen is that more and more of these common people, especially in the North, the Second Great Awakening happens more in the North, and hardly any in the South, but they're going to want to reform what they view as a sin in society. So they're going to view the way that we treat the mentally ill as a sin, the way uh, we treat people in debtor's prison as a sin, and eventually they're going to view the way we treat slaves as a sin, and we'll get to that later. Uh, one of those groups that are kind of that kind of came up during the Second Great Awakening is the Mormons. Uh, the more formal name is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It's going to be founded by a guy named Joseph Smith, and Joseph Smith in Western New York, he is going to uh, claim that he has a a vision from God to reform and make a new church because he's seeing all of these new denominations pop up, right? And so he, he really doesn't know which one he should join, and so he prays about it, and uh, he feels like God has called him to form this new, uh, you know, branch of Christianity that's supposed to be the Reformed Church, the actual church of Jesus Christ, the way that it's supposed to be after uh, he left, and and so without getting into the details of what the Mormons believe, that's what they kind of thought was their calling. And so whenever they felt called to do this, they're going to be really persecuted by it. A lot of people are going to view them as as you know crazy people that don't really you know that that are going against the way that the church doctrine has always been. And whenever they are going against that church doctrine people are going to react to that, and they're going to react very violently. In fact, in this town right here of Nauvoo, Illinois, Joseph Smith, so they're persecuted over in New York, so they move to Illinois, Joseph Smith is killed, this guy, Brigham Young, is going to take the Mormons out west to what's now Salt Lake City, Utah, and here they're going to build their own society where they can be free to practice their new religion as they want, and, uh, you know, here 
it's still a very, very heavily populated Mormon area even today. There's a lot of Mormons still that live in Utah and Arizona and this area of the country because of that trek that Brigham Young took them on that many years ago. But they were able to grow and, and their church is still around today and it's because of that trek they made to Utah. So uh, another way that people are going to look at uh, society in this time period is not really from a uh, religious aspect, but more of a nature aspect. So transcendentalism, you see this is Henry David Thoreau here, um, it's really not really a religious movement, it's a philosophical movement. And so people are looking at especially the first industrial revolution and seeing how people are getting really wealthy, how people are starting to value the products that have been made in the uh, industrial revolution more than they end more than they are their personal life or their relationship with other people. And so transcendentalism is a reaction to that, a reaction to that materialism. They're going to tell people that, you know, we should be more focused on preserving nature and uh, forming relationships with other people and going out in nature and giving back and stuff like that instead of just acquiring more and more wealth. And, um, uh, you know, another impact of the first industrial revolution and of the second industrial revolution is that it's going to really hurt nature. There's going to be a lot of pollution put in the air and deforestation and stuff like that. And so they're going to look at that industrial revolution and say, well, we need to get away from that. So they oppose that materialism, but they also try to support nature when they do that, and intuition as well, uh, logically thinking through things and doing the moral thing, not the thing that's going to make the most uh, money. So along with the uh, idea of transcendentalism, you're going to see these utopian communities or utopian uh, societies pop up. And so a utopia is a sort of a perfect world. And, you know, most people know today that a perfect world d does not exist but back then, they're going to look at all the problems that are caused by, like, the first Industrial Revolution, and they're going to say, well, we need to get away from that. And so there's different groups, Brook Farm, the Shakers, Oneida, uh, but what all of them do is a reaction to uh, this accumulation of wealth and materialism that's caused by the first Industrial Revolution. So what a, a society is, they will go into really seclusion, and they're going to be very restrictive of who can join their community, but they're going to do things the way they want uh, things to be done, and they're going to really make their own rules. So, you know, the Oneida community, they value the uh, idea of, of like, group uh, activity and group togetherness. And so they even encourage the idea of the, the joint raising of children, whereas all of the children in that community are not going to be raised by just a, a mom and a dad by everyone in that community. So that's just an example of them putting into action one of their beliefs. And, you know, within these societies, they, they all really fail. None of them are still around today. Uh, I think there's still a shaker or two still alive in... Uh, up north, I think in Massachusetts, uh, as of 2019, but th they're not going to be around for very much longer. All of these utopian societies are going to fail eventually. So uh, Dorothea Dix is a woman that, that kind of along those lines wanted to reform society. Uh, she would look at an issue and she tried to do something about it. So the issue that she looked at was the mentally ill and the asylums in the United States. So before uh, Dorothea Dix came around, the way that the United States would treat its mentally ill was sort of like a prisoner. You, you would think that they had not really a disease that can be treated, but that they had committed a crime almost. They would be put, as you can see here, they would almost be locked up like in a jail. Uh, here this guy is tied down to a chair, uh, so they were treated very, very bad. They uh, were viewed as an outcast in society. People would not want to associate with the mentally ill. But what Dorothea Dix is going to do is that she's going to go around the country and she's going to write down in a journal all of these conditions and uh, then she's going to take them back out to the public and try to shape public opinion. 
So that means she's going to try to convince people that the way the country was treating the mentally ill was wrong and that something needed to be done about it and eventually laws will be passed because of Dorothea Dix and her work uh, that changed the conditions. So uh, another one of those people that tried to uh, change society is Horace Mann. So Horace Mann focused on education, whereas you know Dorothea Dix focused on the mentally ill. But what he's going to do is he's going to look at the uh, lack of education, especially in the South. You know, you have to remember in the South, especially around the area where we live in North Carolina at this time, most people did not go to school if they were poor or even if they were more middle class. Typically, the people that would get an education were the wealthier people in society. So the idea that Horace Mann came up with is the idea of public education, which is uh, supported by taxes. So whenever you go buy something or pay income taxes or something like that, a portion of that money goes to the school system. And that way, the school system can be free to everyone and when it's free to everyone even the poor and middle class can go and get an education and you're opening up education to not just the wealthy and he's also going to make it required uh, starting off you didn't have to go to school until you were 16 like today it's going to be much younger but over time that age will be increased and it all came, came comes back to the ideas of Horace Mann uh, and his ideas about education uh, another movement that's going to be around in this time period is temperance. So uh, you've probably heard of prohibition and how alcohol was eventually banned in the United States. Well, the temperance movement is kind of a precursor to that idea. What the temperance movement is going to do is try to reduce the amount of alcohol that people drink. And so it, this movement is going to be especially led by women because they would see how violent their husbands were when they would drink and how the husband was not able to support uh, you know, her, his wife and the family when they are essentially alcoholics. So the women in the temperance movement tried to cut down on that consumption. They would try to get people to uh, take pledges that they would cut down on their or on the amount of alcohol they would drink. They'd also produce cartoons like this one that show the effects of alcohol. You can see how you start off drinking one, it eventually gets worse, and over here, uh, death would be the end result. And and so, you know, if, if you saw this, you, it would make you reconsider what you were doing to yourself by drinking all of the alcohol. And uh, ultimately, this movement will not be very successful. Um, and eventually this movement will lead to prohibition later on in American history, too. So, speaking of women, and keep in mind the women led the temperance movement. Uh, there, women at, at this point in history, early in the 1800s, uh, they are going to be more or less confined to the home. So that means they have to stay in the home. They have to cook and clean and raise children uh, and have children. And the men were more or less supposed to be outside of the home working and making money to provide for the family. And so that idea is called a separate sphere. The women are going to stay over in this left-hand sphere. They're going to raise children. Like in the picture, the men are going to be out in the factories working. And so in this time period, a lot of women did not really question this idea. There's going to be a few later on that will, uh, with the women's rights movement, they're going to try to go out and um, and raise awareness about how women are being restricted by the system, how they're not allowed to do what they want to. Um, another thing that goes along with this, at this point, women could not vote, so they were not going to be represented very well by the people in elected office. So until women get the right to vote, their condition is really not going to get that much better. But it's going to take a few women that we'll talk about in just a minute uh, that's going to lead the way against this idea and other restrictive ideas that hurt women. And, and that's really going to happen at the Seneca Falls Convention. So Elizabeth Cady Stanton, she is a woman that is going to be kind of the champion of women's rights. She's going to be the one that's going to spur the idea of a women's rights movement. And so in Seneca Falls, which is in New York, she is going to read a 
a declaration or a list of statements and she's going to model it based off the Declaration of Independence and she's going to go through a list of things that men have done to restrict women and to restrict their freedom. And whenever she does this, what you're going to see is that, that initially people are going to view her as some kind of radical outsider that people shouldn't listen to. But over time, her ideas are going to gain more and more popularity. At this point in the 1840s, she's going to start talking about women earning the right to vote, um, women working outside of the home, and stuff like that. Now, eventually, the women's rights movement will be successful, but it will be successful later on. Well, why did it take so long for it to be successful? Well, the women that led the women's rights movement, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton, was seeing the issue of slavery start to come up. And so she was okay with the women's rights movement taking a back seat to slavery. Uh, but over time, once slavery has been abolished, then the women's rights movement will start to pick back up. It'll end uh, in the 1920s in American history too, when women earned the right to vote with the 19th Amendment. And so the issue that kind of caused the women's rights movement to settle down, at least for a little while, was abolitionism. And so this movement is going to be popular, especially in the North. The South is going to hate this idea completely. They are going to be opposed to it 110%. But what this idea is, is that you're going to end slavery everywhere in the United States, and you're going to do it immediately. So there were some people, even if they supported the concept of ending slavery, they wanted to do it gradually. They wanted to do it maybe in a certain area of the country and then allow it to spread a little bit at a time. Some people were even uh, saying that we should pay, that the United States government should pay the slave owners for uh, the slaves that are now going to be freed as sort of a way to make that money back that they would lose from the slaves. Um, but this movement is going to be completely opposed to all of those ideas. They want slavery to end everywhere, and they want it to end right now. And so this movement will start to pick up, especially because of the Second Great Awakening. Uh, people are going to be more religious, and they're going to say, well, you know, God loves everyone, and that includes slaves. And so if we are enslaving a group of people, a group of God's children, uh, then we're not being very religious. And so that's how they connected it to the Second Great Awakening. One of those people that's going to be very important in the abolition movement is William Lloyd Garrison. So he is going to create a newspaper. Uh, I think he lived in Massachusetts. He's going to come up with the uh, Liberator, which is a a newspaper and keep in mind that William Lloyd Garrison is a white abolitionist not every abolitionist was uh, a slave or an ex-slave and in this newspaper his ideas are going to take it one step further than just ending slavery everywhere and, and ending it immediately he said that if it took violence to abolish slavery everywhere and abolish it right now that it's okay because conditions of slaves are that bad that violence is justified if needed. Now, he didn't want violence. That wasn't his first uh, choice. But if the South was going to be resistant to abolishing slavery, and you know they would be resistant to abolishing slavery, then he thought that we should use violence to do so. And eventually that's going to happen with the Civil War, but that'll be later on. But uh, William Lloyd Garrison is really the first one that starts to champion and promote that idea um, outside of slaves themselves. There had been some slave rebellions before this that were violent, but to end slavery across the entire country, he will be uh, the first person to come up with that idea, uh, to use violence. Uh, another abolitionist is Frederick Douglass. Now, he was a black abolitionist. William Lloyd Garrison was a white abolitionist, but Frederick Douglass is a very uh, important figure in American history. He was a former slave that managed to escape, and his escape story is very complicated and detailed, but just know that he managed to escape, and he went on to get an education, and he wrote an autobiography about his life and how he escaped. And unlike William Lloyd Garrison, now this is the most important difference between the two of them. 
William Lloyd Garrison wanted to use violence, if necessary, to end slavery. Frederick Douglass wanted to use the government and the legal system to end slavery. He did not want to use violence to do that. Now, event, now the Civil War was violent, but its purpose, at least early on, was not to end slavery everywhere. Uh, now, which idea or which theory is going to be more successful? William Lloyd Garrison's or Frederick Douglass's? Well, it's going to be Frederick Douglass because slavery will be abolished using the 13th Amendment, which was passed by Congress or the government. It was not... Uh, it, now, it came about as a result of the Civil War, but the thing that in slavery definitively and forever in the United States is a law. And so Frederick Douglass's idea is going to win out in the end. Uh, another abolitionist uh, that you need to know about is Harriet Tubman. Now, she was not, uh, you know, more or less writing these books like Frederick Douglass did. What she's known for is helping sla uh, slaves to escape. And what she did is came up with the idea of an underground railroad. So an underground railroad is a system where people uh, along these different routes of the underground railroad will have a house and a slave that has escaped can stay in that house during the daytime and then at night that slave can go and on the run and try to get to the north. Now right here the border between Maryland and Pennsylvania is the Mason-Dixon line. They, the slaves knew that if they got out of Maryland and into Pennsylvania they were free. Eventually they're gonna have to go to Canada because of the Fugitive Slave Act but we'll talk about that later. Uh, and this really is going to anger the South. The South is not going to like that they are losing slaves. There's going to be a bounty on Harriet Tubman's head. The South would love for her to be captured. They would more than likely execute her if she was captured. She carried a pistol with her whenever she was helping slaves to escape, and she was willing to take her own life than to go back into slavery and be put on trial and likely be executed by the white southerners and so she was very very brave she went back to the south many many times even though she was already free she had already got her freedom she wanted to help other slaves to gain their freedom and uh you know it took a lot of of courage for her to do that but she did it and she did it many times so the last term that we're going to talk about and this review PowerPoint is Nat Turner's Rebellion. Nat Turner was a slave. He was also a preacher. Now, uh, the slaves are going to tie their Christianity to their condition because they view it as sort of um, a hope for them that one day they will be free and that God will help them to become free. So what Nat Turner is going to do, and the South uh, did not really, they wanted the slaves to be Christian. They wanted them to have a, a religion and they were okay if the slave preachers would come in and talk to the slaves and hold you know a sermon on, on Sundays or, or whatever day of the week and the South would sometimes justify their use of slavery using the Bible uh, but anyway what Nat Turner is going to do is that instead of doing what the white slave owners wanted him to do which was go in and preach to the slaves he's going to go in and talk to the slaves about organizing a rebellion. This happens in Virginia and it's going to be a fairly successful rebellion because he's going to get all of the slaves together that he had talked to and they're going to go out and they're going to kill over 50 uh, white people in Virginia, including women, including children. They did not uh, pick or they did not spare anyone uh, regardless of their age or of their uh, gender. So Eventually, the rebellion is going to be stopped, but when that rebellion is stopped, the South is going to panic because they feared that another Nat Turner could one day come along and rebel and be even more successful and let it get out of hand even more to where all the slaves in the South could rebel. And what the South is going to do in response to that is pass a stricter slave codes. So we talked about slave codes as something that would restrict slaves and their freedom well that's going to happen even more eventually the slaves uh cannot have these sermons like nat turner had unless there was a, a white person in the room to kind of uh, supervise the sermon make sure they're not going to plan a, another rebellion but the south passed a lot of stricter slave codes took away even more freedom from the slaves 
and eventually the North is not going to like that. They're going to be less apt to go along with that, and over time that tension will help cause the Civil War, but we'll talk about that later on. So that is the end of the Unit 5 Review PowerPoint. Go ahead, use your notes, and take the Unit 5 Review Quiz.